The Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Welcome to Deep Dive with the Institute for Justice. I'm Melanie Hildreth, and I'm here with IJ Senior Attorney Jeff Rose and IJ Attorney Diana Simpson. The Catherine H. Barber Memorial Homeless Shelter has been serving North Carolina's Wilkes County since the 1980s. But a recent decision from local authorities there has put the shelter's survival at risk. In today's show, we're going to talk about what's happening and why IJ decided to get involved. Diana, can you start by describing the the decision that was made at that local government level? Of course. So the shelter received a generous donation of an office building. They were in need of moving to a new space, um, and they got this great donation, um, and it was in the perfect location. The building itself was fantastic, and so they were going to do some renovations and be able to move in and um, you know have a, have a new home for them and their clients. Um, and the, what they needed to open, um, in addition to their renovation work, was a conditional use permit from the local town. Um, and so they met all of the requirements and they assumed that they would submit their application and they would they would get their permit and they would be able to open. Unfortunately, that's not the way it worked out. And the town denied them a conditional use permit um, for some pretty suspect reasons. So initially, you know, hearing that a permit was denied does not sound too outrageous because most people listening have probably had permits denied by local government. What is it that made this an issue that a national civil rights law firm wants to engage with. I think it all boils down to the fact that the Board of Adjustment, this was the the decision-making body here, they admitted that the shelter met all of the requirements to obtain this permit. Um, It was in the exact right location. Physically, the building was what they needed. Um, But the quote was that that doesn't mean it belongs here. And so really what's underlying all of this is that it's, there are these very specific requirements that you need to meet. Um, but beyond that, the, the town has placed these kind of amorphous requirements that itself wants to place on people that are really just kind of made up. And that, that's not the way local government is supposed to work and make decisions about property. Well, and, and maybe let me pick up here just to put it in the simplest terms, um, the a uh, town's law requires homeless shelters to be in the highway business zone and to have sidewalks. And then they ruled that you can't have your permit because you're too close to a busy street and people are going to be walking on the sidewalks. So it's exactly that kind of contradiction that is so irrational that it becomes unconstitutional. And the reason why IJ got involved is because this case isn't just about the homeless shelter here. This case is about these kinds of irrational laws being applied to property owners and entrepreneurs in a thousand different contexts all over the country. So let's talk about some of the specific requirements, because I think most people feel like, you know, a homeless shelter does expose maybe a neighborhood to a certain amount of risk because of people coming and going, or um, there are a lot of reasons to think, okay, you know, putting a couple of extra uh, requirements on these kinds of buildings or these kinds of uses of buildings is not that unreasonable. Um, Can you describe uh, what exactly the requirements were and the ways that the shelter met them? Of course. And so there's two kinds of requirements that are kind of floating around here. Um, And so the first set of requirements are the objective um, kind of bullet pointed requirements that are from the code. And so a homeless shelter cannot be within 2,500 feet of any other homeless shelter, and it can't be within 250 feet of any public park or school or residential use. Um, For those reasons that you mentioned, Melanie, that, you know, a homeless shelter does kind of have different types of uses than than perhaps a neighborhood. And so you wouldn't necessarily want it right next to a school or someone's house. And so they they have this this distance requirement. Um, Beyond that, it has to have access to a public sidewalk. Um, The staff has to, there has to be supervision, adequate supervision so that that people are taken care of and and have their their needs met. Um, It has to be big enough. So there has to be 50 square feet of heated floor for each person. Um, and it has to be in harmony with the general area. Um, beyond that, as Jeff meant to, mentioned a minute ago, it has to be in the highway business district, which is a particular part of town um, that is that is zoned really right through the middle of town along the busy roads um, so that it's you know right on public transportation, easy to access, all of those things. Um, 
And then, so those are kind of the initial requirements that you have to meet according to the code. After that, you have to get the conditional use permit, which you apply to um, the town's board of adjustment to get. And so when the town uh, board of adjustment considers these conditional use permits, they have a hearing where they invite neighbors to come and talk and they look at a very specific application with a fee and a site plan and a storm, storm water management, all of these kinds of issues. Um, and the board then has to make these findings that the use will be appropriate for that particular area. Um, it can't endanger public safety. It has to comply with all of the other regulations, those ones I just met, um, I just mentioned. Um, it can't substantially injure the neighboring property values, or it has to be a public necessity. Um, again, it has to be in harmony with the surrounding area. Um, there has to be adequate public water and sewage, all of those kinds of things. Um, and, and, you know, all of these things were the shelter met. So can you talk a little bit about the ways that they that they did comply? Because I think for, for people who haven't been down to North Carolina, you know, they don't have the, the mental picture of where where this actually is. Um, Jeff, you mentioned that it was a on on a in the business district, it has a sidewalk. It, it, it's complying with those sort of physical um Right. Just, you know, those those physical pieces. But what what other things is it is it doing that just show how hard the folks there worked to be in compliance with all of these rules. Right. Well, you know, applying for a conditional use permit in North Wilkesboro, even though it's a small town, is the same as doing it in any big city. Everybody listening has gone through this bureaucracy 101 thing where you fill out a bunch of forms and then they tell you you didn't do it right. And then you go back again and you try again. And then they tell you to get a bunch of studies and hire experts and get engineers to draw up plans. And the whole thing takes months and months and months and months. And then at the end of the tunnel, you emerge into the light, having satisfied all the criteria, and they're supposed to say, okay, you did it. And, and the, the criteria here, as Di Diana listed them, uh, you know, they're really long. They did everything right. And then the town still said no. And, and the, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, and they, and they spent thousands of dollars, as I recall, to, to do this, right? right? Thousands of dollars, months of time. Um, all of the efforts of the volunteers who worked, including uh, one of the board members is a traffic engineer. And so, you know, he spent a great deal of his own personal expertise for free doing this. And th this process for them was the same thing everyone has gone through and has pulled their hair out over. But the particular problem here is that even though they followed the law, satisfied the law, the town till still arbitrarily said no. And this actually goes beyond just violating their own laws or goes beyond a reasonable exercise of discretion into the forbidden realm of being unconstitutional. This is just uh, disrespecting people's property rights in such a profound and irrational way that it violates the 14th Amendment. So before we talk about the the legal aspects, just one, one more practical question, which is the, the stakes for the shelter and the people who use it. So where if this is denied long term, what happens to to the shelter? Because I I think we we didn't mention it's the only shelter for the whole county. It's been there for decades, but it's really the only option for these people. Is it is it the case that if this doesn't go through, well, they just don't get to expand, but everything's fine. It's status quo. It worked for thirty years. It's still fine. Or what what happens to the people that this the shelter is serving? I mean, this space is critical for the shelter, for the shelter's clients, um, and, and for the county, really. Um, it You know, right now, they are operating in a, a temporary haven at a church that is just outside of town. Um, and the church is a great location for them, and it, it's wonderful that, that the church is allowing them to stay and, and all of that. Um, but it's not quite right. It's not quite right of a space for them, because it is out of town. They do have to take a bus into town to get to the services they need to apply for jobs, to go get food during the day. I mean, the shelter is only open overnight. And so everyone has to leave in the morning. Um, this new space that they had been donated that they, that they wanted to use is right in the middle of town. It's right next to a McDonald's and a dollar store and all of the services that the clients need. And so when we say that it's an ideal location, it, it really is. Um, it's just so easy for people to get what they need and, um, you know, get back onto their feet and back kind of going where they need to go. And, you know, most of the clients of the shelter um, aren't really your, your long-term homeless people. Um, you know, they're primarily people who've just fallen on hard times and which particularly now is that's a lot of people. And so, you know, in the church, they've got 
about 10 beds, this new space they would operate, they would have about 20, which would be great. Um, it would be a great opportunity. They certainly wouldn't fill it up every single night. Um, but it would be great to be able to provide that to people who, you know, just lost their job and, and fell on hard times and need to get back on their feet. And it's done that for so many people over the years. And they'd like to continue doing that and do it in the best way possible for the clients and for the, for the people in the county. And, you know, I, I would like to underscore that this is the kind of shelter whose work is particularly critical because it is a short-term transitional shelter. Nobody is staying there long-term. These aren't the sorts of shelters that are trying to manage the profound urban homelessness that you might see in large cities. These are like women escaping abuse or somebody, you know, a marriage breaks up and the the husband has to go somewhere, but he doesn't have anywhere to stay. And if he if he leaves town to go stay with a relative, he loses his job, that kind of thing. And so they this shelter allows people to stay for a week or maybe two weeks at the most in order to get sufficiently stable that they can carry on with their lives as productive members of society. And, you know, they're moving to this space because a dentist generously gave them a building for free. It's not as though there's an unlimited supply of free buildings out there um, and that they can just go down the street or do something else. This was an act of special generosity on the part of the dentist, an act of special charity on behalf of all of the on the part of all the people who work there at the shelter. And they completely satisfied the law. And the town turned around and said no. Um, And so- So yeah, it's very much a community trying to to help its own um, and and being prevented. And so the you know on the the legal side, obviously the, this real world, this this it matters a lot, and we 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 care a lot about these people. But as a strategic, a public interest law firm, um, this is the, there are also these important legal questions. And Jeff, you started by by mentioning that this is a constitutional issue, and so I, I wanted to talk about that. As well, can you talk about first the property rights components of the case and and why it matters as we look at the law from a property rights perspective? Sure. So our property rights, like our economic rights, are subject to the lowest level of judicial scrutiny. It's the rational basis test. I'm sure um, I'm sure folks out there have heard that before. And one of IJ's strategic objectives <clears throat> is to move courts in the direction of being more protective of property rights and economic liberty through the rational basis test, tightening it up, making it stronger um, so that citizens have better defense. And so the the long-term implications of this case are really two. One is horizontal and one is vertical. The horizontal one is that um, a property, rights, property rights cases and economic liberty cases are all subject to rational basis review. So as I mentioned earlier, there are all kinds of contexts, including IJ cases in other areas, in which getting a court to rule that the rational basis test really means something, that it subjects the government to meaningful scrutiny, that evidence matters, the government can't just uh, carelessly invoke hypothetical justifications. That matters across a broad range of liberty, um, both in economic and property context. The the vertical direction is that our, our, the facts of our case are almost exactly the same as the facts of an important Supreme Court case from 1985 called Cleburne v. Cleburne Living Center. And in that case, um, a shelter for the mentally handicapped in the town of Cleburne, Texas, sought a conditional use permit uh, under their zoning code, and they satisfied the requirements, and the town said no. Um, and so the, the only difference between us and Cleburne is that we have homeless people and they had mentally handicapped people. Now, the the kind of doctrinal significance of this is that Cleburne used exactly the kind of engaged rational basis test that IJ has been advocating. And so this is a vehicle because of its factual similarity to Cleburne, we can go up to the federal courts of appeal and then maybe springboard to the US Supreme Court and say, the, the the way the Supreme Court articulated the rational basis test in Cleburne in 1985 is the right way to approach it. Courts have drifted away from that, and now it's time to right the ship. Um, and so that's why IJ seized on this case as an exceptional public interest opportunity. So that that's kind of a, a sort of high level, you know, we, we, we want to vindicate economic liberty. And then you mentioned also zoning. And so I'm wondering, you know, in terms of, again, just sort of the practical implications there, does this mean that if we win, courts will say, 
zoning laws violate economic liberty or can you how, how does that how would how would this actually look in practice if we get a victory say up at the supreme court you know sure. on this so, case in this context sure so the so the practical thing is whether your property rights are being expressed in the form of economic liberty or more traditional property rights like you owning a home what it means is the government tries to make you do something or require you to satisfy a particular criterion in order to develop your property or to use it you will have an extra arrow in your constitutional quiver um, and that the government in drafting and enforcing rules will do so with the idea in mind that they're now being held to a higher standard. So what does this mean in practice? Like, let's suppose um, let's suppose somebody wants to op open a business and the, the government says, well, uh, no, we're not going to let you open a business here because you're in the 500 year floodplain. Um, that's rational in the abstract. I mean, maybe you don't want people opening businesses in floodplains. But then if you turn around and say, uh, you haven't been using this justification for all these other guys up and down the street, so what's the deal here? You know, under, under the weakest form of the rational basis test, uh, it might be sufficient for a judge to say, look, all I'm looking at is, is there a justification for what they're doing here? Let's call that the floodplain. Um, in this more engaged, more searching version of the rational basis test, we look at the evidence, we look at how the government is enforcing it, we lift the veil a little bit to see what's really going on. Um, and so the practical implications for people running businesses or owning their own homes is that we want to be able to make it more difficult for the government to be able to order them to do all kinds of arbitrary things. I mean, what, one crazy thing that I'm sure a lot of homeowners can relate to here in Austin when we decided we wanted to... Uh, get a permit to fix a bathroom, to enlarge a bathroom, we had to jackhammer up our driveway and put in ribbons because the city of Austin said, well, you can't fix your bathroom unless you have more permeable cover on your lot. And just because we don't issue permits anymore if, if we think you have deficient permeable cover. So that just like randomly added $5,000 and a bunch of time to this job. And so uh, you know, probably something for $5,000 isn't worth making a constitutional challenge, but that's an example of just a random shot coming in from left field that hits property owners and entrepreneurs all the time. And we're hoping to create real world practical barriers through the constitution for that sort of thing. And when when you, uh, Diana, were describing the the situation that the the shelter has gone through and, and the the way that it met the the local the, I, the was it the town council um, or the the regulatory body there yeah, the board of adjustment board of adjustment and they they just decided they just decide no um, it seems pretty clear that in this case this isn't about trying to get them to do more things with the property or sneaking other things in it actually has to do with the fact that it is a, a shelter. Um, how does that play into the constitutional arguments or the the just the the legal analysis in general, the the way that it seems like the shelter is being targeted because of the people that it's trying to help? I mean, it it, it shows how irrational the decision was, right? And so the the town pointed, the board of adjustment pointed to three reasons that it denied this permit. Um, they said that the traffic safety was a concern um, because the the road was busy and the clients would be using the sidewalks. Um, but those are requirements to have a homeless shelter in town. And so that that's just so clearly irrational. Um, they said that it would substantially lower the neighboring property values. Um, it's not likely that any homeless shelter is going to increase the surrounding property values, but there are other reasons to have homeless shelters in town. And so requiring something that is likely impossible is also irrational. Um, and then the third reason was that there was this lack of harmony with the neighbors. And it's always hard to, to discuss this kind of amorphous understanding of what harmony is, because it can really mean whatever any regulator wants it to mean. Um, and I think a lot of people probably do have that kind of experience. And, you know, once you kind of push away and, and, and investigate the actual reasons that they've, that they've done and these irrational reasons they've, they've, they've said, you get down to the heart of the matter, and it, it's that they don't particularly want a homeless shelter in a, a visible part of town. And that's just not acceptable. The government can't sit there and say, this this kind of property, this kind of use is unacceptable for this property, where it checks off all of the boxes. We've said that a homeless shelter can open here, and so it should be able to open here. The fact is, the, the building has been empty for several years. It's not been in use by the dentist um, as, a, as an office building. 
And, you know, it's not next to, you know, these super fancy places or anything like that. It's right on a busy road. It's walking access to a McDonald's. Um, And those are the kinds of places where it should be. And the town really just doesn't want visible homeless people. And that's not an acceptable thing for a government body to do. So one of the other components of the case that that made it interesting, and I know it kind of dovetails with other things that you're working on, Diana, is the the way that this kind of application of permits, of fees, of fines, of the regulatory structure of, you know, especially at the local level, but, you know, going up higher, um, the way that it really disproportionately falls on sometimes the most vulnerable people in a community. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and how it plays out in the law in this case. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, Jeff was mentioning just a little bit ago that in order to, um, you know, renovate his bathroom, he also had to spend an extra $5,000 on his uh, driveway. And that's something that that Jeff was able to do, presumably. Um, And now he's got both a nice bathroom and a little bit more, um, you know, permeable (laughs) permeable driveway, driveway, whatever that that particular goal is. It means a driveway that's half concrete and half gravel. It's basically (laughs) what it Doesn't sound like a huge improvement, but... (laughs) Um, but in any, any event, someone like Jeff is, is capable of, of making that. Um, the problem here and the problem in a lot of places is that by denying the conditional use permit, it's it's not as though the shelter can just say, OK, well, we've got this kind of money sitting elsewhere and we're going to turn to another place that we can go. Um, this particular building was perfect for them. It was free. It is a, a building where they would take it over. They would have the cash to renovate it, but they wouldn't have to spend, you know, hundred thousand dollars plus to buy the building itself. And so you end up with a situation where these decisions, you know, it's not something you can just deal with and move on. It often means the end of someone's ability to to do something. And, and, you know, as towns and municipalities and, and local governments increase the amount of fines and make things more difficult for everybody, there's going to be a certain point for, for, anyone, but but particularly kind of the lower income folks, there's going to be a point where they just can't continue. They can't do what they want to do because they just simply don't have the money. And that that's what we're seeing a lot of. That's what a lot of my cases end up being about is, you know, government demanding something that in the abstract, you know, perhaps I'd be able to afford, but someone else might not be able to. And that creates this situation where people just miss out on things that they should be entitled to because they don't have enough money. And that's that's not the kind of country that, that the United States should be or, or really was founded upon. Right. You know, and, and I think that touches on a larger theme of IJ litigation, which is we're advancing free markets and property rights because they help everybody. And indeed, free markets and property rights can help or be especially helpful to people who are most disadvantaged because the things that they are running up against, the bureaucracy and the rules, are frequently designed to exclude them. I mean, the the entire history of zoning is the history of exclusion. First, it was was racial exclusion, um, and now it's basically economic exclusion. And, you know, even, even granting the reasonableness of not wanting to have grossly incompatible uses next door to each other, an elementary school and, uh, you know, a chemical plant or something like that. Um, you know, if you if you're a town planner and you don't want people of modest means living in your neighborhood, you don't create a law that says you have to earn one hundred thousand dollars to live here. What you do is you create a zoning law that says your lot has to be this big. There has to be a certain setback. You have to have a minimum number of bedrooms. It all has to comply with the international building code, et cetera, et cetera. So that the only practical way to to purchase a house is to have two or three hundred thousand dollars to spend. Um, and so, Again, in, in our economic liberty work and here in our work with the with the homeless shelter in this case and other areas where we've done that, we are trying to to establish the free market, the liberty oriented solution to chronic problems like affordable housing. So you know, just as a, a kind of final thought on that note, if things go as we hope in this case and and we win and maybe you know at the uh, appellate court or the Supreme Court even, um, what kind of case would we be looking for next? Where do you go beyond the homeless shelter to advance those goals? So I think beyond the homeless shelter is to actually address um, all of the exclusionary zoning rules that make it difficult for people to build 
houses that fit their budget um, and fit their needs. And so there are all kinds of people who just can't afford to live in cities, not because they can't afford to build nice houses or houses that are safe and sanitary. It's that they have to build houses that a cookie cutter zoning code requires. So they have to live in houses. So for example, you know, there's a huge tiny home movement across the country that is that is both on the one hand, you know, advocates for low income people think is great because it's a it's a low income alternative to a regular home, but also people who are environmentalists or people who are just philosophical minimalists, people who want to spend their money on other than a $300,000 mortgage. Um, and zoning codes across the country make that kind of evolution in housing extremely difficult. And so by creating constitutional rules that protect the right to build on your property, either for commercial or residential purposes, according to your own lights. Um, that's something that will, you know, can apply in other contexts and where IJ imagines, uh, where we imagine ourselves going next. Well, good luck to you both. And thank you for taking the time to talk through the case and, and those goals. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can find more on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe.